I'm Lane Slater. I'm very privileged to be able to introduce my close friend and colleague, not to mention the new chair of our uh, Department of Humanities and Social Sciences, Dr. Ronald Bernier. Uh, he's a true Renaissance man who to date has earned his MA and PhD in Art History and Theory from Essex University in England, an MBA from the Whittemer School of Business and Economics at the University of New Hampshire, and an MA in Theology and Religious Studies from the University of Scranton in PA in uh, Pennsylvania, and is uh, probably working towards another degree as we speak. He has served on the faculty at a number of universities um, and colleges, both in the U.S. and U.K., and is the author of numerous exhibition catalogs, scholarly essays, and books such as Monument, Moment, and Memory, Monet's Cathedrals uh, in uh, Fonda saint uh, France, 2007, and Beyond Belief. Theo, aesthetics are just old-time religion, a collection of essays on religion and contemporary art that was released in June of 2010. He is the former director of the Sardoni Art Gallery at Wilkes University in Pennsylvania, uh, the Sioux City Art Center in Sioux City, Iowa, and associate director of the Cranach Art Museum, University of Illinois, and Champaign-Urbana. As someone who's worked in close collaboration with Ron since he first stepped foot on campus three and a half years ago, rewriting old courses, developing new ones, and leading us in the newest and most thought-provoking directions, I can say firsthand that, he, that his credentials are really the only, only the tip of the iceberg of a superior scholar, a teacher, an innovator, and a colleague. This afternoon he's speaking on layers of discovery, strata of memory, the art of Elise Wagner. Here's Ron. Let's see, I think we need to go back. Whoops go back to my quotes. Well, it's great to see so many people here uh, this afternoon. Um, what's going to happen is, and Karen gave you a little bit of uh, a sort of plan of, of, uh, plan of action for the afternoon. I'm going to speak um, more briefly, I think, about what intrigued me as an art historian uh, about Elise's work, what first drew me to, uh, to her work when I first discovered it a little over uh, a year ago. So I'm going to be speaking from an art historical uh, perspective about, uh, about her work uh, in general. And then, if, uh, and then my colleague, James O'Brien, is going to open up the discussion, I think, to talk about issues relating to using Elise's work to talk about uh, relationships throughout history between art and science. Um, and then at the end of James's talk, uh, uh, Elise Wagner, our visiting artist, uh, is going to address us, going to say a few words. Uh, and then the three of us will take uh, questions and answers, uh, and then we'll all just uh, reconvene over uh, to the food in, in the gallery. Um, but before I get started, I do want to introduce our esteemed special guest uh, today, Elise Wagner. Um, Elise uh, originally came, is from the New York area, although now uh, makes uh, her life in Portland, Oregon. She's been, working, uh, been a working artist for nearly 30 years. Her fascination with science led her to a Bachelor of Science degree from Portland State University in Portland, Oregon, with a major in painting and printmaking. Over the course of her prolific career, uh, Elise has continued to study and explore the relationship between science and art, uh, using many symbols found in astronomy, physics, and alchemy. Uh, Elise, uh, Elise's work aims to reflect the seemingly illogical and arbitrary order inherent in today's uncertain world. Uh, she was the recipient, recent recipient of a career opportunity grant from the Oregon Arts Commission uh, that helped fund concurrent exhibitions just this past spring uh, at the Chase Young Gallery in Boston in the South End and the Sordoni Art Gallery at Wilkes University in Wilkes-Barre, Pennsylvania. Her work is held in private and corporate collections throughout the United States, including, just to name a couple, uh, Kodiak Venture Partners, Saks Fifth Avenue National Collection, LPL Financial, and Bullard Law. 
Uh, she exhibits her work at Chase Young Gallery in Boston, and we have Chase Young Gallery to thank for the works we have on view here. And she also exhibits, exhibits on the West Coast at Butters Gallery in Portland, Oregon. Most recently, uh, Elise was asked to loan her work to the television show Portlandia, which premieres its second season on the IFC network in January 2012. So first, can we just welcome Elise Wagner. Given that um, Elise's work deals with the intersections and the, indeed the connections between art and science, I thought it would be appropriate to begin with uh, a quote from the esteemed Albert Einstein. I think most of you can make that out, but it just simply reads, the most beautiful experience we can have is the mysterious. And what I want to talk about today is the mystery of Elise's work, mystery of art and science. It is a fundamental emotion that stands at the cradle of true art and science. And the, the work that I'm showing you, uh, which is in the gallery, is entitled Counter Collision 2 and dates from uh, 2009. Um, I also want to begin with a sort of reflection to introduce my remarks today uh, on the idea of discovery. And I've just brought together uh, a couple definitions of the word discover to make known, all of which I think apply in Elise's case, to make known or visible scientifically to reveal, in the archaic sense, to disclose, to bring to light, or to allow to surface, surface something once forgotten or hidden. And I put that up because the question I want to consider today is to what extent uh, an artist can visualize the invisible realms revealed by science, uh, as it seems that throughout history, no matter how unimaginably inexplicable uh, nature came to be seen, both artists and scientists have wanted pictures of it. This picture is entitled uh, Flare Horizons, also in the gallery from 2011. Uh, the slides do not give you a sense of both the texture that I'm going to be talking quite a bit about of images and certainly the scale of Elise's work. This one is um, about 28 by 26 uh, inches. Amid the the blinding speed and digitization of our modern visual culture, Elise Wagner's painting compels us, that is the viewer, to do one thing essentially, and that is to stop and pay attention. That is, they speak to the passing and unfolding of time in human experience. The time involved, first of all, in our engaging um, visually with very thickly, and you'll see this in the gallery, thickly pigmented surfaces, and with the layers of seeing and memory embedded in that activity of looking. So it's an optical density to be sure, but it's also what I want to call a phenomenological density. It's an experience in which each canvas sustains the, the, the long and calculated efforts of painterly revision, which itself suggests the, the visual, the mental, and the emotional complexity of our so-called instantaneous or momentary perception. And I think there's a curious paradox to be found in Elise's painting, a paradox or a tension between the seen and the unseen, between the certain and the uncertain, between order and chaos, between understanding and wonder. It's a tension that prompts the ex what I'm calling the extended dimension to our visual or perceptual experience, well beyond any temporally bound or spatially confined instant of seeing. Even the primordial nature of the medium she uses, the ancient medium of encaustic, uh, which I'm sure she, she will explain, is essentially a, a beeswax uh, mixed with pigment and resin. Even that ancient medium itself dates from the 5th century BC Greeks, uh, the medium itself speaks to an enthrallment with time. The layered surfaces that you'll see with their chiseled edges, and you can just make out a bit of that in the slide here, but you can certainly see it in the gallery, uh, suggests the look and feel of something unearthed from another time, coaxed, as it were, from the geological and archaeological strata of history. Now, a quick word about the process of Elise's work. Uh, her process is slow, and methodical and deliberate, as our ex visual experience of it must be. 
She begins with a thin birch plywood panel onto which she layers a chemical mixture of pigmented wax fixed to the surface while the, the mixture is still hot. And we can, we can sense her patient, uh, deliberate, persistent layering of pigment. And the result, the visual result, is, is literally arresting. With surfaces so vast and so deep, even when the images are in small scale, that we enter, lose ourselves, and yield to a pull powerful enough to sustain our prolonged attention. This work, uh, also in the gallery, is entitled Event Horizon 3, from just, last, uh, just this year, from 2011. And I've put it up with a quote from an early modern, early 20th century philosopher that I want to refer to for uh, a couple of minutes here, uh, Henri Bergson. The passage from his Introduction to Metaphysics in 1903 reads, duration is a continuous life of a memory which prolongs the past into the present. Without the survival of the past into the present, there would be no duration, but only instantaneity. And I put that up here because Elise's painting, uh, at least um, what drew me to Elise's painting, um, I think it captures the visual effect of what philosopher Henri Bergson called la durée, or uh, duration. Basically, the notion that our conscious states should be understood not as a sequence of successive yet separate and discrete moments or coordinates, uh, but as a multiplicity constantly and continually unfolding in duration. It's basically talking about time in consciousness. Uh, it's not incidental that Bergson's ideas and philosophy gained popularity around the same time as Einstein's special theory of relativity. Uh, essentially the, the idea that space and time do not exist independently, but rather are joined in one concept of space-time. In fact, uh, after attending a meeting where Bergson heard for the first time about Einstein's general theory of relativity, is reported to have said, quote, I see in Einstein's work not only a new physics, but also a new way of thinking. So for Bergson, at least as far as I'm using Bergson, in relation to Elisa's work here, reality is a temporal process, a continuous becoming, uh, enduring in time, in which memory is a potent factor. On this view, every moment of our conscious life carries with it influences from the past, even as uh, the present reworks these influences in preparation for the future. So the so-called instant of our perception then really contains memory of the past as well as intimation of the future. Memory, in other words, is the past living on in the present in our perception, affecting our momentary visual and perceptual and emotional behavior. This is a work, uh, again, that you'll see in the gallery, and here's a good example of where slides uh, misrepresent the scale of the work. Um, this is entitled L.A. Runway, and this piece is only 12 by 12 inches. Um, and this, uh, what, what I've just sort of articulated and reviewed from, uh, from Bergson is what I'm suggesting Elise Wagner's paintings attempt to, to capture both in the activity of, of her painting itself, that it's its own lengthy and mindful process, and in our, the beholder's activity of viewing. Um, Bergson, again, might illuminate this sense of viewing, or what I prefer to call beholding. Uh, and again, I'm quoting from his uh, introduction to metaphysics. I think part of it is cut off here. It reads, there is a continu continuous flux, a succession of states, each of which announces that which follows and contains that which precedes it. I could not have said where any of them finished or where another commenced. In reality, no one of them begins or ends, but all extend into each other. Consciousness means memory. Here are two works, two large works in the gallery. Uh, the top image is entitled Remnant Horizon from 2011. And the work uh, down below is entitled Quantum Singularity, also from 2011. Wagner applies her color concoction and then scrapes it off, then rubs it down, then applies it again, and still again. 
working and reworking each panel numerous times so that layers build up one atop the other. When you go into the gallery, look closely and you'll see that each image retains traces of its prior, of its earlier configurations, very much like vague and elusive memories of earlier states, but nonetheless still perceptible, still present to our awareness. And all this painting, scraping, abrading, burnishing, effacing is repeated and multiplied both across the surface and into depth and all the more effective perhaps when on large scale like in these two works, these uh, measures in 20, uh, 24 by 70, 70 inches across. And all of this creating a sense of sometimes a, uh, an unsettling sense of simultaneous nearness and farness conveyed in the very texture of the paint itself. Within these highly charged fields of color, successive states of awareness, to use Bergson's term, merge into one another, each retaining something of, as, of what has just passed, each giving suggestion or intimation of what is to come, a kind of blurring of the boundaries, as it were, between past, present, and anticipated future. And these layers, these palimpsests of paint, encourage us to linger and to note the marks of presence and absence as they emerge and fade. Now you will have noticed that embedded within these layers are marks, or as I prefer to refer to them as, as glyphs. They're signifiers not yet signified, or not quite signified, illusions to the claims of scientific truth. We find, and you'll see a number of them in the work, star chart grids, ganglionic webs, astronomical spirals, celestial nebula, spectral lines, and a host of other abstract motifs borrowed from scientific diagrams about the structure of matter and energy. All of this incised and embedded into those layers, that layered waxy surface. And all of this elicits and deliberately elicits from the viewer a continuous shifting in our perception of forms a perception of the buildup and overlap of stages that demands that our visual attention adjust, keep up with her painting in order to, to accommodate, to read those various possibilities within the subject. It's all about the behavior of perception. And perception in Elise's work is a matter of doing a lot of work. It's a matter of adjusting losing focus, then calling back into focus, back into memory. The painted surface, however, remains remarkably smooth. From first geological layer to last, translucence is sustained. Light continues to pass through the waxy membrane. So, it's the process of painting itself that conjures that gradual disclosure, what I called in the first slide, discovery of elements and features that we at first didn't notice. Uh, and so if we didn't notice, they're absent in one sense, absent from our view. They're absent in the sense that their temporary non-occurrence is always there, but always, uh, it's always outside, but included in the background of the present of our momentary view. And that state of being momentarily unnoticed and then recalled is part of our, the viewer's, very complex experience of the ineffable, the hidden, and the unknown. But of course, there's much about the images that urges us to reflect not on the ineffable, but on the certainties of science. We only need to consider, for instance, the specificity of the titles of her work. Titles like quantum singularity, event horizon, magnetic parallel, counter collision. A veritable primordial soup of particle physics, astronomy, alchemy, and other scientific symbology float up to the surface and then recede, embryonically reaching the point of meaning just before fading away seemingly random marks taking on the signs of human intentionality, like 
kind of like gestures in some kind of primitive writing. And while such evocative details might suggest an element of event, fact, incident, or even narrative, something, in other words, that we can latch on to as we seek a lucid image of the world, um, that meaning, I think, is always just beyond reach, teetering at the edge of reference. Our relentless um, drive, our relentless penchant for order and meaning against nature's indifference is teased and tweaked in her painting. We're constantly reminded of the conflict between our ordering impulse and nature's resistance. And for those of us who might be more philosophically or even spiritually inclined, and while I don't have the, the time to go into it here, we might uh, invoke the idea, or paintings might invoke the idea of the sublime, the philosophical sublime, of the aesthetic sublime. Um, in the presence of the sublime, we feel that kind of straining of the mind against the edges of itself, at the very edges of rationality, prompting a mode of reverence for what is unimaginable. And that very experience in the sublime of a kind of lack of fit or disproportion between the mind's rationalizing, ordering, conceptualizing power and some kind of ungraspable complexity out there then might serve as a kind of analog for something other. That other could be the infinite, the unknown, perhaps even a divine other. These two works are entitled, on the bottom is Absolute Horizon 1, that's the one work I'm showing that is not in uh, the gallery, and at the top, Absolute Horizon 2, uh, which is in the gallery. The very sensuously layered, successively painted and repainted and reworked surfaces of Elise's, uh, uh, Elise's canvases sustain uh, I think the visual effect of duration, as I articulated it earlier. But it's a duration that's both temporal and spatial. As I said before, the, if we, when you're standing in front of Elise's work, the earlier stages of configurations, are, of, of her configuration, of earlier stages of her painting, are just as present to our awareness as the final surface marks. At the same time, however, the viewer is made to take, and you'll see this in these, the large images in the gallery, the viewer is made to take a very disengaging look down onto or into the surface of representation, pushing beyond the limits of the conventional picture frame, which disallows any reassuring sense of a single, coherent, unified, momentary view. The beholder feels him or herself released from gravity, as it were. We both hover over the surfaces and peer into their depths, our disengaged viewing steered by a painterly medium at once fluid and solid. And in terms of distance and scale, we wonder, are we microscopically close or galactically far away? The entire pictorial surface of Elise's painting is, I think, the embodiment of these discontinuous multiple perceptions through an extended encounter with space-time. What these paintings do, and what I think they do so well, is to register our sense of the world, our experience of the world, not as a single coherent thought or feeling or perception or even emotion about it, but rather the world, the universe, uh, the world's relation to us as precarious, as multiple and unfixed, and so continually subject to revision and wonder. Thank you.